2021, in commemoration of the Center for Global Health's 10th anniversary, we launched this Global Cancer Research and Control Seminar Series. In this series, we feature talks by researchers and cancer control experts working in global oncology and provide opportunities for discussion and collaboration around impactful and innovative work that addresses cancer morbidity and mortality worldwide. In today's session, I'm most honored to welcome Dr. M. R. Raja Gopal. It's not every day that one has the opportunity to introduce a Nobel Peace Prize nominee, not to mention someone who has had an unmatchable and profound impact on the field of palliative care and the lives of everyone around him. So please forgive me if I'm a bit nervous about my task today. Uh, Dr. Raja Gopal is the director of the Trivandrum Institute of Palliative Science. He is also the director of the WHO Collaborating Center for Training and Policy on Access to Pain Relief at Trivandrum and the founder and chairman of Pallium India. From what I've learned about Dr. Raja Gopal's work, I can see how the vision of Pallium India really mirrors Dr. Raja Gopal's lifetime commitment. And that vision is an India in which palliative care is integrated in all healthcare so that every person has access to effective pain relief and quality palliative care, along with disease specific treatment and across the continuum of care. His initiatives to remove regulatory barriers in av availability of oral morphine for pain relief have contributed to simplification of narcotic regulations, amendment of the Narcotic Drugs and Psychotropic Substances, Substances Act of India. His initiative has contributed to the development of government policy on palliative care in the state of Kerala and the government of India's national palliative care strategy. In recognition of his incredible work, the international organization Human Rights Watch honored him with the Alison de Forge Award for Extraordinary Activism. There is a documentary film about his work entitled Hippocratic, 18 Experiments in Gently Shaking the World, which is based on Dr. Raja Gopal's contributions to palliative care. Highly recommend viewing that. In 2017, he was also named one of the 30 most influential leaders in hospice and palliative medicine by the American Academy of Hospice of Palliative Medicine. In 2018, Dr. Raja Gopal was honored with Padma Shri, which is the third highest civilian award given annually from the Republic of India. And most recently in 2022, he published his memoir, Walk with the Weary, which describes his palliative care journey. Before we begin, and before I turn it over to Dr. Raja Gopal, I do have a few logistics to share on this slide here. As a note, today's presentation is being recorded and will be available on our website at cancer.gov slash global health. You can find information about future presentations on our site and by following us on Twitter at NCI Global Health. The questions will be addressed during the designated Q&A time immediately following Dr. Raja Gopal's presentation. During that time, you may either use the raise hand feature, as you can see on the screen, which is featured under reactions, and wait to be called on, or you can type your question in the chat box. If called on, please unmute yourself and ask your question, and we will try to get to as many questions as possible, time permitting. So with that, it's over to you, Dr. Raja Gopal. Thank you. Namaste, everybody. This means I go to the divine in you. I truly do. Uh, uh, Mishka, thank you for that generous introduction. And uh, Nina and uh, Rashad, thank you for this opportunity. Indeed, a very important opportunity to address some keen minds about things that really matter. Uh, allow me to share my screen. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to talk of, about the palliative care scene in India. Uh, it's just one country, but it's about one sixth of the world's population. But whatever I am saying, I'll try to relate it to the 
general situation in low and middle income countries and from a description of the, uh, the situation in palliative care in india i'll go on about the relevance of research in this field which i think is vitally important some of you may be familiar with this uh, beautiful poem by terry catering about an elephant in the room it's large and squatty so it's hard to get around to it yet be squeezed by with how are you and i am fine and a thousand other forms of trivial chatter friends we do have a huge elephant in the healthcare room we pretend not to notice it life is easier if we refuse to see it this is the nature of that elephant in the healthcare room though it is 55 years since palliative care came to birth globally and though palliative care is inexpensive the lancet commission for which i have given the reference here of 2017 estimates that is an essential package for palliative care delivery including the staffing costs only 2 to 3% of the cost of universal health coverage for low income countries and only 0.6% in low and middle low middle income countries it's as inexpensive as that yet the elephant access to palliative care is scarce or non existent in more than 80% of global population that lives in low and middle income countries that is statistics translate it to 51 million people in low and middle income countries in serious health related suffering like this man with advanced cancer uh without pain relief even without even basic pain relief less than 4% of indians have pain relief available to them any meaningful pain relief the situation is as bad as that but apart from that uh, error of omission we have an even worse situation as far as vulnerable population are concerned women subject to gender discrimination those at the extremes of age children and the elderly do you know what it is to live with a disability in a, in 80% of the globe those who have paraplegia are confined to life imprisonment within four walls those with uh, uh, other reasons for stigma and isolation the lgbtqia community prisoners those who are geographically isolated and those who are culturally isolated as tribal population it is unimaginable the kind of lives they they live and the kind of deaths they die as i said it's easy to pretend that this does not exist but i have not yet talked about the worst of it these are the ways in which healthcare commits errors of omission but what about the errors of commission an british oncologist of indian origin writes the, this that they in, that in india the poor die in misery of neglect the middle class die in misery of ignorance and the rich die in misery on ventilators that is the huge error of commission that i am talking about <clears throat> in india when one is at the end of life if the family has any money in the pocket they are pushed to intensive care units again to life imprisonment with torture added by a tube in every orifice where they die on artificial life support systems with deaths being pr- prolonged over weeks or sometimes months that is clearly enough commission but that's not the only one 
Dr. Christopher Booth of Queen's University a few months back gave this talk. He talks about low value cancer care based on research in high income countries research initiated in high income countries and if some uh, new chemotherapeutic agent which is beastly expensive is shown to prolong the lifespan by 4 months it is promoted at that huge cost but not only cost of money but also poor quality of life all the time spent in hospitals that's what chris calls time toxicity and this again is a reality that we pretend not to notice the numbers are tremendous 55 million indians according to this paper published in 2018 in british medical journal are destroyed by catastrophic health expenditure every year that's more than 4% of the population and in world bank data india comes something like 12th remember there are other low and middle income countries which 11 of them which are worse than india in this feature now these are the two errors of omission and two errors of commission that actually we need to do something about it and remember the destruction by catastrophic health expenditure is less in high income countries where people could afford to afford it this again is from world bank data see the enormous numbers in middle income countries who are destroyed by modern healthcare how long will this go on your duty and mine which is in india defined by a uh, statutory body of government of india the indian council of medical research is to mitigate suffering to cure sometimes to relieve often and to comfort always haha <laughs> this is what uh, the document says there exists no exception to this rule nowhere does it say that life should be prolonged at destruction of the family uh, on a ventilator uh, to just to keep a heart beating these are realities which we need to face so that's the situation i have been mourning about the problem so far if we have to find solutions we shall have to address all these three sides of the triangle professional education as well as public awareness i don't think one is more important than the other access to essential medicines particularly control medicines and policy translated to action in countries like our mine very often there is a huge gap between policy and implementation so that needs particular mention but there have been some positive changes i am glad to report that things are good looking better <clears throat> undergraduate medical curriculum and undergraduate nursing curriculum now includes <clears throat> palliative care the india in 2014 amended its law covering governing opioids and morphine is now oral morphine inclusive is now on essential medicine list india formed a national program for palliative care in 2012 and in 2017 india created a national health policy in which primary care is inclusive of palliative care these are huge advances no doubt so we provided we are able to translate this to action we can expect much more to be done but the solutions that we are offering are they all with a not with a high income country lens do we really know what people in lmic suffer 
what the elements are suffering here? Oh, yes. We classify them just as Dame Cecily Saunders classified it in the 1960s. We do. But are the, are the problems same and are the solutions, can the solutions be similar? These are questions to be asked. These are questions for which answers need to be found. These two others that I given uh, the reference for in the bottom point out a great difference between the view of personhood between Western countries where individual autonomy is paramount compared to South Asian countries where it's more relational. My existence is not only as an autonomous individual, but my autonomy actually gives way much too often to family autonomy. This doesn't mean that one is right or the other. This is the reality. And we have to take this into consideration when we are communicating with somebody about bad news, when we are considering the spiritual makeup of the person and offering solutions, and socially and physically. That is just one example of how we need that low and middle income country lens. When we look at problems, human beings are the same, but the way we are brought up and we have uh, the cultural background of is different. Let me tell you a story. The first part of the story is not easy to hear. We now look after Geeta. That's not her real name, of course, but that was her real home. What you see there, that chicken hoop, was where she lived, abandoned by her husband, this woman with juvenile diabetes, who has been advised above knee amputation, and who has been blind for the last four years. Before we found her, or she found us. The story is that she that the story that she told us was one Sunday when they had no food over the weekend. The son, who was then twelve, said, "Mom, I cannot bear this hunger anymore. Let us kill ourselves." And the mother said, "Somehow, son, hang in there just for one more day." I promise that I'll find some way of, uh, some solution tomorrow. She says she herself had considered giving poison to the child and killing herself. But when it actually came down to the point of doing it, she couldn't bear the thought of killing her own child. And she held on. Next day, she got to a hospital, a government hospital, and a kind doctor took her in. One member, a sweeper in the hospital from that day on, took on the task of feeding her. She would bring food for them every morning, which they would eat through the day. When we had seen her, she had lived in that hospital for nearly three months. Ladies and gentlemen, is it any job of a palliative care unit to look after a person like this? Life-threatening illness? Diabetes? That's what the WHO definition says, life-threatening illness, blindness. Can we just shrug and walk away saying that, no, not yet. We cannot give you palliative care. Wait till you are dying. Then we will come and give you tender, loving care. <clears throat> we made sure that she had a, the care of a diabetologist and a podiatrist. We made sure that she got a retinal surgery so that after four years she could see her son again. That's the picture of the mother and the boy. And the boy is now in school. They have a roof over their head. They no, no longer live in a chicken hoop. And all that was made possible by engagement as a community. It was just one social media post.
which got her the money that she needed to survive if somebody comes and tells me in fact such things have been told that uh, no this is not palliative care you shouldn't be doing this i would say or any of my colleagues would say we don't care if you if it falls under your definition of palliative care if somebody is suffering like that we refuse to turn the other way ladies and gentlemen look at these two images the first panel shows i mean a colleague's daughter drew this she has drawn this picture where the first panel represents primary care and on the top there is palliative care so in a high income country the primary care system supported by specialists would have taken care of her problem and we could have come in later but this is the reality in 80% of the world there is a huge gap unmet need who will fill the gap this is not only our experience i have heard a nurse in uganda say she was faced with a woman with obstructed labor in her home she said they say that's not my job but how can i turn away i refuse to turn away and we say the same thing if those people in suffering are there we have to face the issue and in 80% of the globe palliative care units wherever they are there will have to take on this additional gap because once we undertake to take health related suffering we cannot turn away the solution does not lie in development of a few palliative care units alone the solution lies equally or even more importantly in integration of palliative care into healthcare where every single doctor every single nurse and physiotherapist and pharmacist and social worker uses employs the principles of palliative care undertakes to treat suffering along with treatment of the disease and this needs to be supported by the community because if the community did not chip in she would have never walked again she would have never seen the boy again so friends the foundation of community support integration of palliative care and healthcare at which we are only making a beginning and supported by specialist palliative care units for difficult situations is what we see as the solution this business of a community participation which is not only in the within the community which which they can extend in the form of service of volunteers to all over the healthcare field which is happening more and more certainly in my state of kerala gradually spreading to other places globally and within my country once we engage with the community once they understand can you think of any single community anywhere in the world where there are no good people who get some pleasure who do not get some pleasure out of helping others they are there everywhere they would welcome an opportunity to make more meaning out of their lives but once they employ engage adherence to treatment will improve and the community will make sure that there is a balance between preventive promotive curative rehabilitative and palliative healthcare whereas we healthcare professionals like me tend to concentrate just on diagnosis and cure ignoring everything else and the community will take will will dare to see the psychological and social issues and this thing that the astana declaration talks about integration of multiple sectors like education agriculture all of them anything that is contributory to health 
that will happen i cannot imagine government departments engaging with each other closely like that but let me tell you why i show this image our home is a team found that a man living in this small hut uh, with advanced cancer was unable to lie down during the monsoon he was sitting on a chair holding an umbrella because the roof which could not be thatched that year was leaking all over which hospital which healthcare service could have done anything about it we would have shaken our heads and walked away leaving some more pills there for the man to swallow feel sleepy and still unable to lie down but because the community was engaged a few volunteers and one of our medical social workers went the next day and pulled a huge uh, sheet of tarpaulin over it enabled the man to lie down in a country like ours this kind of engagement solves the real problems they made sure that this man living on top of a hut could have access to drinking water that the children could go to school again all these are parts of healthcare of course engaging with the community as partners in healthcare as the stana declaration asked that engagement is not possible unless we go through a certain process first would be creation of awareness this is adapted from a world health organization recommendation of 2016 willing volunteers are then trained we go through this exercise village after village those who volunteer for uh, uh volunteer their services are trained and then we implement their participation while continuing monitoring and uh, engaging in course correction wherever is, it is necessary and what do the volunteers get out of it satisfaction meaning of life they need to be appreciated they need to be given that feeling that their lives now matter and this is precisely what the astana declaration asked participation of the community in development development also policies and plans and implementation but uh, friends here in lies a problem this means they are now equal partners that means i with my white coat and stethoscope round my neck have to give up some of my power engage with them as equal partners treat them with respect but when we do that this is the only hope we have to push that elephant out of the room to where it belongs we may have to break open a door or two and doctors and nurses cannot do it by themselves there are some essential requirements the volunteers may not have as many degrees as one of us professionals but they are i clearly recognize them as above me because without getting any money remuneration they are giving themselves to suffering people walking into a strange field but of course it is possible to do harm with all good intentions so following the training ground rules and values are clearly established and continued monitoring and quality assurance are essential and the community will not get together and engage in this without a facilitator a healthcare provider who believes in the power of the community will have to act as facilitator that is not romanticize the community too much it's not as if everybody is the community or is an angel there will be problems western interests will come in 
they can be personal that is easier to deal with religious and political vested interests will be much harder to deal with but that will let be faced the ground rules and values must be kept and we have to keep monitoring quality of care the fact that the community participates is no justification for any drop in quality of care that's not the major challenge the major challenge is that we have locked the healthcare door we do not allow the community to come in oh we have many excuses what about the medical legal issues who will take the responsibility they don't know enough any number of excuses can be found but if we want to improve the care to these people we have to break open these locks so this is where i bring research in first get rid of the high income country lens if we are in a low income country put on a low income country lens and there to look at the problems that they really face and then we find that the famous total pain circles may need some modifications you will find that economical issues become the most important at times families losing their homes next generation also getting wiped out these are realities we find out what exactly the emotional uh, the elements of suffering not from a, the oxford textbook of palliative medicine but from actually what we see in the local population and then we need to decide we need to find out whether the solutions that we offer them are really of any value is that the effective one efficient one cost effective one these are things that we like to check as it happens ladies and gentlemen i would like your attention to this for a minute and a half i have given the reference here research in palliative care from high income from euro american countries yeah according to less than 15% of the population happens to be 93.5% of scientific publications and from 85% that is rest of the world row from rest of the world that's 85% the input of scientific publications is 6.5% you see what i meant about a high in high income country lens this is the lens that we have used to study the problem and this is the abysmal state of the lack of research on the problems and the solutions in the rest of the world other than euro american countries and uh, uh, tania pastrana and colleagues including indian colleagues together made this study uh, earlier i said that it's only 6.5% okay there is at least 6.5% great among them they took the data if the first author is from a uh, low middle income country or if the data are from a low in middle income country they included 245 articles pertaining to palliative care and they found again that only a tiny minority i was earlier grumbling about the small number here and amongst them such a tiny percentage 26% is from low middle and low income countries uh, in this audience there must be numerous people interested in research i fear that the majority will go in towards 
drug trials and uh, the latest in pharma development which may help a lot help in overcoming diseases but also helping in destroying families unfortunately but i hope some of us will engaging in putting on that lmic lens and look at problems and help to grow this number ladies and gentlemen i believe there is an unintentional colonization of healthcare uh, nobody really wants to be colonial but that has happened as i showed you from the data there has to be a willful decolonizing of palliative care in low and middle income countries with need based research this is why i said that low and middle income countries cannot afford not to do research what are the gaps what exactly do our people suffer from what are the gaps in palliative care delivery okay a little happens is that the optimal what has been tried what have been the successes and limitations the few attempts at integration of palliative care into all health care what lessons do we learn from the efforts so far how can they be improved how can they be made more cost effective and efficient there has been this significant effort at community participation in my state of kerala uh, more than 300 community based organizations work at the uh, in even in small villages sorry uh, and what do we learn from them they have huge lessons to give us more than 300 organizations taking care of their own people suffering people in their own community it's not a small small thing there are lessons to be learned and looking for new solutions why do such huge gaps exist between policy and implementation how do we further education uh, the board ravindranath tagore prayed for a country where knowledge is free at least palliative care education where when there are people who want it can we make it even more widespread than we do now we have been trying hard but we need support there is so much of education to do and we need access to essential medicines very recently the world health organization has started talking about a supply chain so that inexpensive generic medicines like immediately oral morphine can be made available in low and middle income countries that's not going to be an easy task but every experiment needs to be researched studied so that we can make a substantial improvement in course of time ladies and gentlemen thank you for uh, listening to me so patiently uh, i believe i have stuck to time i'll be of course very happy to answer any questions and i'll be happy to come back to any other slides if necessary thank you very much wow thank you so much dr rajago paul that was indeed very powerful um as one of the um participants noted in the chat uh and i think your words and your messages were clearly outline why we invited you here today. I think that this was um really both powerful but also instructive for us as a as a global cancer community. So thank you very much. Um I am going to open up now um for questions and um as a reminder you can put the questions in the chat 
and then we already have a couple. I'm um, also, um, can, you can raise your hand using the uh, reactions feature at the bottom of the screen. If your bandwidth allows, and I do see some people turning on their cameras, please turn on your camera so we can see you and make this um, interactive and so that Dr. Roger Gopal can also see you as you're asking your questions. I'm going to start with the first question, which comes from Francine Baker, um, who is a fellow here at uh, the NCI. Uh, her question is, how do we integrate palliative care and healthcare? Is this a matter of academia to address, policies to be made, government programs, initiatives by community-based organizations, or a combination? And I think you touched on much of this in your talk. Um, I also had a similar question around that in terms of what your recommendations would be, particularly for the research community. So over to you, Dr. Raja Kapal. Uh, Mishka, and thank you. Francine, thank you. Uh, thank you for giving me an opportunity to bring that up. So how do we integrate palliative care into healthcare? This integration can be at the macro, meso, or micro level. Let me explain what I mean. If, as I mentioned, happened in India in 2017, palliative care is in, included as part of primary care by national policy, provided it's also implemented. That's the macro level. When a law governing opioids is changed so that easier access happens, that's a macro level change. A macro level change can be several components. Meso level would be at the level of say an institution or a chain of institutions. If a whole institution uh, in India working with us, two cancer hospitals declared themselves pain-free hospitals where every doctor and nurse is trained in pain management. Every patient is asked, you do you have pain? And it is measured. And every doctor and nurse would pro provide the pain management with only difficult pains going to the palliative care team. That's a meso level. And the micro level is Francine Baker herself taking a decision and integrating palliative care into her daily practice. A cardiologist looking after a patient thereafter does not look only at the uh, valves and the cardiac index. That person is able to look at the patient's face and say, you look anxious, you have some questions. And when he asks that, that cardiologist has begun that integration. Short question and long answer, Francine. Have I answered you? Yes, thank you. That was, that was a very, very good answer. Thank you. Thanks, Francine. Thanks, Dr. Raja Gopal. Um, Satish, you have your hand raised. Yeah, thanks so much, Mishka. Thanks, Dr. Raja Gopal, for a great talk. I was curious um, to what degree you have incorporated patient reported outcomes into your research in India. As you know, the NCI has made major investments in this area in recent years, because I think there's quite a body of literature suggesting that symptom burden is much better captured when patients report it directly, as opposed to relying on clinicians and nurses and other providers as intermediaries. We do, I'll say this as a medical doctor, we do a very terrible job of capturing what the patients are experiencing. So how have you applied some of those methods in your work in India? How successful has that been? Has there been major adaptation that is needed to occur for those tools to be successful in India? I'd be curious about your comments there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for bringing it up. I'll accept that we do precious little research here. One of the things that uh, is challenging is that, uh, okay, every clinician is overloaded with work. Like I mentioned Christopher Booth here, he, uh, a few minutes back, he has published a paper where he compared to cancer hospitals and found that a cancer hospital, in, a oncologist in India sees about five times as many patients in a day. That kind of overwork is a reality 
and also a nice excuse for us not doing research. The fact is, unless you, with the research expertise, put on the low middle income country lens and come and help us, most of us cannot do effective research. We haven't had the training and we do not have the resources. We have plenty of excuses for not doing it. So thank you for asking that question and allowing me to make this plea to everyone here. I hope the, an organization like NCI and everyone involved in uh, this discussion will consider helping a low or middle income country to study the issues and the solutions. The patient reported outcomes as you say. Uh, honestly, I really do not know how many people have studied that in my country. I haven't looked, but I expect that it would be precious little. So much needs to be done. Thank you for being interested. Thank you. And I do see we have um, another hand raised, Dr. Uh, Buha Nudin. Apologies if I've mispronounced your name. Uh, uh, very inspiring uh, lecture, sir. And I've been a fan of your work and uh, follow you quite a lot. <laughs> Uh, so uh, two issues, sir. Uh, one was the the fact that you did mention that in comparison to that that slide of yours in which you showed two uh, two bars, uh, one the LMICs versus the uh, the HICs, and how the uh, uh, a good basic care in the HICs and uh, the void in between uh, the pal care as uh, as opposed to uh, care, but. Uh, 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 but the whole point is that uh, like we we need to integrate both and we the uh, uh, we need to integrate palliative care more so that you know uh, uh, that that gap is bridged bridged uh, however how uh, like uh, isn't uh, uh, isn't the problem itself uh, you know in the sense what i mean to say is that the the quality of care which we are not able to provide in 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 countries like india is because uh, of uh, right from the quality of physicians to the uh, to the infrastructure healthcare infrastructure those are the main problems why that gap uh, is there on the first place okay and uh, uh, we need community participation we need more integration uh, but but uh, uh, but won't it dilute again? Like uh, won't it? Uh, I, I I still fail to understand that how uh, actually this this problem will ever. <laughs> uh, I am not able to probably you know explain that. I I feel that the one is leading to the another, and uh, and and you, that was my uh, by my you. question, sir, like your thoughts. Thank you. How do you pronounce your name? May I ask? Uh, so you can just call me Burhan, sir. Burhan. Uh, Burhan, thank you. Burhan, thank you. Uh, I, did, I, I was speaking. Okay. I did not put on my health care lens. I was speaking only with my palliative care lens. Thank you for pointing it out. Absolutely. The solution it's not for palliative care people to go in and try to fill the huge gap. The solution is indeed to improve healthcare, primary care, specialist care, everything. The only thing that we I'm saying is when we are at it, when we actually face the unmet need, we are unable to walk away. So really the primary solution is to improve primary care. No doubt about it. But in the meantime, we are unable to run away from what we find in between. But Burhan, thank you very much. The point is well taken. I totally agree. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Burhan, as well. So, um, Suda, I know you have your hand raised. I do want to ask, there is a, a point in the chat um, just to, to raise as well. And Sandra, if you're willing to unmute and possibly share, um, Sandra Mitchell has, oops, now I've lost it. Um, posted here to, to support international conduct of cancer clinical trials, including palliative care. Uh, we soon have completed validation of the National Cancer Institute's 
um, pro CTCAE in five Indian languages. I don't know, Sandra, if you want to mention more about this, and I'll also direct folks to check it out in the chat. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't have a lot of additional uh, comments to make, but just um, that very much uh, underscore what's already been said about the importance of having outcome measures that are linguistically and culturally tailored. Um, and in particular, this is an instrument that is a companion to the CTCAE to capture symptomatic adverse events. It was developed by the National Cancer Institute under uh, a series of contracts. And um, we have now uh, linguistically validated this uh, instrument in, gosh, about 50 plus languages uh, for adults and children. And um, we're really excited that our, our work in India is going to be wrapping up soon and we'll have uh, some of the uh, languages available. I think the first one's gonna be Tamil that should be ready sometime uh, very soon. So um, I don't have a lot else to say, but I did put our website and people are welcome to uh, message me uh, here at NCI in the Outcomes Research Branch. Sandra, thank you. I have made a note of uh, the website and I hope to study this uh, more. Thank you very much. Thanks. Excellent. Okay, Suda, over to you. For your and, and thank you for a wonderful talk. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, just so many very meaningful things that you've brought up this morning. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mishka, and thank you, Dr. Rajgopal. Good to see you again, and thank you for your really inspiring uh, uh, words and work. Uh, I just wondered if you could speak a little bit about where in the curriculum of nurses and doctors training in India is palliative care uh, taught, if it is taught, and um, where is uh, research uh, training um, in, the, in the medical and other training curriculum? Uh... Uh, uh, Dr. Sudha, I have, I, I must admit that I have not gone into the details about the research part of it, at which part of the curriculum it goes in. But as far as palliative care is concerned, it is spread all through. Uh, it is it starts with the orientation program before formal education in medicine starts. Uh, in various uh, departments like physiology and biochemistry, physiology and uh, pharmacology it starts community medicine incorporates it all through so various elements are taught in various uh, sections of the medical education starting from the first year right up to the fifth year the pain management comes under anesthesiology and most uh, end of life care comes under general medicine and pediatrics. But so that there is that unaddressed part about the research. I don't remember. I'll have to look up. Thanks. Thank I you. will do that. Thank you. Great, thank you. So I'm gonna, before I turn it over to you, Sonia, and that will be our last question, I do have a question from Jack Murphy in the chat. Um, and Dr. Rajgopal, he is interested to know is about your experience with implementing palliative care, um, especially when it's in different states or communities, when you're dealing with different linguistic and socioeconomic backgrounds, um, and what have been the best ways to tailor these strategies to the local settings? Uh, Jack very clearly knows quite a bit about uh, the country, India, about the diversity. And you're absolutely right. It would be, I mean, if I go with a Kerala lens to be her and try to replicate what I do there, I would be making a fool of myself. Everything has to be culturally appropriate and appropriate in terms of every other domain of palliative care also. But one thing that we have seen, the little bit of success that we have had in relatively, okay, as far as India is considered, Kerala is considered relatively affluent, but we have had, uh, my other colleagues have had significant success 
in relatively poor parts of uh, india like manipur in the northeast for example only thing is very many things will have to be culturally adapted the kerala model if taken from here to manipur and try to be replicated there is bound to be a failure but one thing is common the one common thing is everywhere there are ordinary human beings who are willing to help others and who take some pleasure out of helping others that's common the resistance to the medical profession is variable but the will people's willingness is common but uh, uh, mr jack bird murphy we are only at a beginning stage it's not as if we have been successful in uh, getting integration or community participation in most of the country by no means thank you so we have thank two you. hands up still oh sonia your hand has gone down um, i was going to turn to sonia and then michael and then we will need to close after that sonia did you still want to ask your question yes i figured um because my um question is i was next in line i i lowered my hand <laughs> excellent talk thank you very much um i but i suppose and i don't know even if my question is connected with research um it's it's my question probably pertains more to laws regulations and resources um and how pallium um helps getting them implemented i mean i'll just explain one very minor thing i mean something as minor as getting iv morphine available is is a huge undertaking and why do i say that last year my mom was terminally was terminal she was dying of cancer i had to every appointment i had to in order to get morphine for her i had to make an appointment every time to get one dose of morphine for her i and i begged the doctors to provide a port so that she could be administered iv morphine at home there was no way i could take her back and forth to the hospital that was not allowed so there i think it's a matter of the laws and how those are implemented the other part as you mentioned community engagement and that needs to be defined too we as a family were willing to get engaged but we needed help right so so then it becomes a matter of trained professionals trying to get trained professionals is another huge challenge and then it is so expensive so somebody if, like me going from usa i can probably afford to get an expensive nurse to come in you know once an hour once a day or two two days twice a day or three three hours a day but mm -hmm. what about the poor community i mean there is no way they can afford even to go and ask for these these um support systems to be put in place so i don't know like i said i don't even know if this is a research associated question or it is about, about you know ultimately getting an overall view to, you know as uh, for the nation of india is itself what are the laws in place what are the availability resources that are being put in place for palliative care thank you uh, sonia thank you i am sorry to hear about uh, your mother's suffering and your failure to get adequate help very very unfortunately that is the situation for 96% of indians and uh, for you particularly it's harder because people here living within india do not even know that pain relief is possible whereas you know that there are simple solutions and living with the fact that those cannot be accessed is so so terribly difficult i accept that the solution is more medical and advocacy related than legal uh, i won't take long but uh, just let me show this image <laughs> i mean this is i am this is not from any official document this is uh, my own perception the problem sonia are that one people don't know that this is a problem oh of course if you have cancer you would have pain what else do you expect is often the issue and more than the legal barriers most of which have been overcome to a substantial amount it is the doctors fears two generations of doctors have not used morphine and there comes sonia with these western ideas crazy morphine 
for somebody with breathlessness you must be crazy yes i was considered insane for asking for a port for my mom so these are all real problems and i do believe that now that we have overcome some of the legal barriers though the law is not implemented all over the country the advocacy to promote it among the doctors and amongst the public is a vitally important next step that's expensive and we generally talk about it and do not do much about it not systematically uh, but uh, this is absolutely needed thank you soni thank you and i appreciate that we have gone over time but this has been a very really engaging discussion there have also been comments in in the chat just to to thank you dr rajiko paul for your talk so michael you get the honor of having the last question and then we will close the session <laughs> thank you um it, it's really interesting so i have a sort of a theoretical question imagine that you've developed a really good treatment for palliative pain care but that you had to administer it by injection into the site where you know of tissue damage or something like that um and it would not be orally bioavailable how how difficult would that be to disseminate that among the various populations and cultures in 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 a country like india or just even use it in general is that too is it too high a bar michael uh, for the 99.9% of the population it's too high bar but uh, kerala a tiny state has a little it's a little better off within the country we do have in patient facilities though limited where such people can be taken care of what we cannot afford to have is the syringe driver that you would not think twice about before sending it home with the patient and a district nurse going and refilling the syringe every day we can't even imagine that kind of luxury but let me tell you what we do if there is somebody willing to learn we put up a butterfly uh, hypodermic butterfly needle connect a syringe and ask the family member to push in 1 ml every four hours of morphine for example we dilute it in such a way that a single one ml is diluted to one dose and we ask the family to keep giving it and the family member comes back every two days with and takes back another fill syringe that's a local adaptation and how many can be can avail that only a tiny number mm-hmm. uh, but yeah. uh, but 80% of the world cannot afford to have syringe drivers at the home right. well the only advantage of this thing is that you only have to administer it once and then problem solved but um even so it sounds like a very high bar just to do that mm-hmm. quite a lot of uh, uh, medication we manage rectally or subcutaneously sometimes but uh, even that's for a limited number of people thank you oh, great thank you. thank you thank you again dr raj gopal you not only laid out for us the very all the important topic areas and considerations you also talked about solutions and you talked very specifically and instructed how the research community can get involved so thank you again um with that i'm going to close our session today um and i do want to mention that we have our next session is with dr rebecca richards cordum and that will be on december 8th and it's on developing novel cancer technologies globally and you can again find it on our website cancer.gov/globalhealth listed below here or look for us on twitter at nci global health Thank you again Dr. Rajiv Gopal. Thank you very much to the whole team here who helped support the session happening today. Um and best wishes to everybody. Thank you. US Department of Health and Human Services, National Institutes of Health, National Cancer Institute, cancer.gov, 1-800-4-cancer.